my pictures from 9-11, I think the images that tell the story and convey the, what it was like is, is the, my views that really show the entire site. Uh, this enormous field of destruction and these tiny little humans, these little men, these firemen and relief workers trying to find survivors, trying to do what they were doing. And, and uh, it was futile. It was, it was this task which was impossible. Looking at the coverage of 9-11, the video and the photography, the still photography, I, I always think that still photography tells the story so much better. There's that moment frozen in time. You can look at it, you can s stay with it, you can come back to it again. It, it burns into your memory. It's something that you can't forget. I would think my pictures tell that story of this epic destruction in a place which was sort of my home, my, my, my neighborhood. My name is Steve McCurry. I'm a photographer. Finding Steve McCurry is no easy task. He has documented the most dramatic conflicts of the past 30 years without ever wanting to depict himself as a war photographer. His portraits have won renown for the front pages of the world's most important publications. His reassuring, intelligible aesthetics and rich colors have made him one of the general public's most acclaimed photographers. He is an incessant traveler, but above all, he is a true narrator who, through the intense gaze of his every subject, delves into existences, gleaning stories, tragedies, and dilemmas that touch the deepest reaches of the human soul. The world's changing so rapidly right now, uh, and there's this rush towards globalization. I really feel that somebody needs to document the way we were, have some record of the past. I think that what fascinates me about photography is being able to show the similarity, the commonality between people, and that at the end of the day, whether you're Chinese or Russian or European or from Africa, what we're basically the same. A member of Magnum Photos since 1985, Steve McCurry first came into contact with reporters of the prestigious agency through photography books during his studies. His dedication, his continuous search for a story and a human dimension took him, in the early years of his career, to lands torn by conflict where he, by way of his pictures, attained the esteem of international publications. It was his talent which led him to a second contact with one of the founders of Magnum, when he received the Robert Kappa Gold Medal in 1980, awarded to him for his exceptional courage and initiative. I've covered a lot of conflicts in my career, but for me, the, the story was always the, the civilians, the the people who were driven out of their country or out of their villages. I, I was never a combat photographer. I've been in combat many times. And to me, that's not where the story is. The, the combatants are generally there willingly. Uh, they're, they're often protected. They have a weapon. They, they, they're fighting out of their own free will. But what happens invariably is that, you know, the, the civilians get caught in the conflict, their homes get blown up, uh, people are at home in their living room and a rocket comes in the window or 
So th to me, that was what I spent my time on. I think the conflict which made the biggest impression on me, which was a sort of monumental, catastrophic environmental damage, was the Gulf War, the first one in the early 90s, where there were more than 600 oil wells on fire. Uh, there was destruction, as far as the eye could see. The Iraqis, before, before they had left uh, Kuwait, burned all the, put all the oil wells on fire, destroyed the city. Uh, it was complete and utter devastation. And I would go into these oil fields uh, in the middle of the day and you, could, you couldn't see the sky. It was like night. And there, there was enormous lakes of oil everywhere. All these poor animals were, you know, horses and cows were winding around, uh, camels. It was, it, was, it, was, uh, it was like an enormous movie set. It was like this surreal world where everything was just destruction and chaos. It was, it was dreadful, awful. The morning of September 11, 2001, remains etched in the memories of all those who turned on a TV that day anywhere in the world. The images flown by of an attack which was, at that time, unthinkable and unfathomable. That morning, Steve McCurry was in New York, looking out over the terrace of his Washington Square home. With his camera, he unceasingly documented the moments directly following the attack on the Twin Towers. 9.59 a.m. is the moment the first tower crumbles before the incredulous eyes of the entire city. 10.28 a.m. The North Tower also falls, sowing panic and terror. I couldn't hear the World Trade Center class, but I could hear all these screams from the park below, and it was this surreal kind of nightmarish uh, memory I have of that, that morning. Back on the night of September the 10th from China, I'd been there for six weeks doing a story on Buddhism. I was in a very sort of mellow, tranquil mood. I got back, woke up the next morning on September the 11th. I got a call that the World Trade Center was on fire. I looked out the window and I saw both towers were on fire. So I, I raced up on the roof to right where I'm standing right here and started photographing, and I thought, this can't be happening. This is, this is unreal. So I, I kept photographing, and the second tower collapsed. And I remember right down below was Washington Square Park. And as the tower was collapsing, I couldn't hear anything from the World Trade Center, but I heard these screams. There must have been about 200 people then I watched the square park here were just screaming. And then I left immediately from ground zero and I spent the entire day there. And in fact, I went back again the next morning. But it was such a beautiful morning that September 11th, the sun was shining, there wasn't a cloud in the sky, and suddenly everything went dark and it was like all this thing. Steve McCurry learned straight off to handle danger by tackling, head-on, the risks of the profession. In 1979, he miraculously brought home the reportage that would make him world famous. And more importantly, would bond him permanently to the Afghan people who, even before the Soviet invasion, had been left to fight their own wars. I was in this very, uh, 
cheap $2 a night hotel in Chitral. And the people standing in the next room to me were some refugees, some Afghan refugees. Uh, one night we were having uh, some kebabs. And they said, you know, you're a photographer. Nobody knows this story. Nobody's paying attention to the fact that our villages in this part of Afghanistan are being destroyed by helicopter gunships. I agreed readily. I said, this is an important story. I want to go. So we decided uh, two days later, I was going to accompany some of these guerrilla fighters, these Mojahideen. So the morning they came to get, get me, I was like, you know, this is like crazy. Uh, but I went. Um, we walked for four days. But a as we got closer and closer to the fighting, uh, I, I got more and more involved, more personally kind of connected to this, to these people and to the story. Um, I ended up spending a month. We, I ended up going right to the front line and uh, seeing the fighting. Uh, people were dying. Relatives were grieving. There were funerals. Uh, and I suddenly this really became the story uh, I got very uh, passionate about. Just as the Mona Lisa is a universal icon of the style of Leonardo da Vinci, so too will Steve McCurry be forever linked to the photo of the Afghan girl who for years was held to be the absolute symbol of her people's suffering. A face, an icon, and once again, a story that affects the world deeply, but especially one which pushes him almost 20 years later to set off in search of her, to portray her as married even more deeply by the asperity of her life. Somehow people connect with that picture uh, often without knowing she's a refugee, without knowing she's an orphan, without knowing she's uh, an Afghan. Uh, it's just something about that look and that expression which captivates people. And, and uh, I think part of the reason is that there's a combination of ingredients here, the different components. She's very pretty. You know, very attractive little girl. Uh, she has these, uh, you know, uh, attractive, uh, you know, very striking eyes. And um, but there's this ambiguity to her expression. She's not smiling. She's not frowning. She has this sort of neutral thing. Uh, despite she's very, you know, pretty, she also clearly her face is a bit dirty. Uh, her shawl is, is ripped. Uh, but she has this penetrating this unyielding uh, gaze, this sense of kind of fortitude and uh, perseverance and, and this self-respect. And the, the reason we went back to try and find her after 17 years was because we had gotten thousands of letters. Everybody uh, was curious. I was curious, you know, where is she? Who, who was she? Is she still alive? Um, so we wanted to go back, I, we, and we got after some days we had a big break in the story because we found the teacher who had been in the classroom that morning that we well, that I photographed her, and through her we were able to eventually find Sharbat Gula's brother, and of course through him we were able to find her, and it was this amazing. Uh, we, we were so thrilled that she was alive, she had a family, she was married, she lived in the village, her kids were healthy, and um, so we were, it was, uh, we were completely uh, thrilled that, that we were able to locate her. Trade Center 
for several decades was one of the iconic symbols of New York. It was one of the landmarks. So when you came into the city, uh, almost from any direction, that was one of the first things you saw. Suddenly this iconic piece of architecture was, was ruined and, and, and collapsed. And, After 9-11, after some months after 9-11, I actually moved my studio very close to the World Trade Center, just about two blocks. And every day that I walked to work, uh, it was a reminder of that terrible day. I packed up and moved to another area of the city. Maybe 800,000 slides of Kodachrome here in my archive. And it was a film I used for 25 years, 30 years. And it was a way of life. And when I heard they were going to discontinue and Kodachrome was coming to an end, I was like, you know, this can't be happening. But I, I thought, you know, it'd be great fun to get the last roll of film and to do some really interesting project. So I talked to Kodak, they agreed, got the last roll. And I thought, well, now, now what am I going to do? So I thought, I need to photograph something iconic. You know, Kodachrome was probably the best film ever made. I want to, it was an iconic film. I want to do something to honor the memory of Kodak. So I thought, I want to shoot something in New York, I want to go to some place in the world that I'm familiar with. So I actually started with, uh, I thought, who's iconic in New York? Who's a you know, quintessential New Yorker? And I thought, Robert De Niro, he's an obvious choice. And then I thought, you know, I, I worked so much of my career in India. Let me go back and do a little bit of a, the role in India. So I found a tribe which was disappearing, and I thought, you know, that this would be a perfect kind of, a, you know, it's a disappearing film, a disappearing tribe. This way of life is coming to an end. My preparation before I go out and shoot is very minimal, very simple. It's unscripted, it's unplanned to some extent. Often I will just walk out of my hotel room, or out of the place I'm staying at and just start looking, start to get into a particular frame of mind. start enjoying the day, uh, start engaging with people that I meet, and let it slowly get into a particular zone. Almost a meditation, I would say, but my, my preparation is I have one camera, one lens. Uh, I don't have any extra equipment with me. I don't have a Usually, as I said, just that one lens. It's a very simple approach. I do everything with that one camera. That's I, th I think one of the abilities that we need as photographers is to be able to engage people, to meet people. You have to
to go up and talk to people and explain who you are, then have them want to actually partake and to participate in this thing. I think 9-11 changed New York in the months following and perhaps for the next year or two. I think at this point, it's not something that we think about. I mean, life is uncertain and you know, there's, there's an impermanence to life anyway, and at any moment, anywhere, we could be snuffed out. So I think people just move along, go along their business at this point. Steve's journey through the world follows rules and ideals, but it has no borders. And yet, there is one land which more than all others has influenced his work, and especially his style. The vibrant colors of Asia taught him to capture the deepest light, to find the balance between ethics and aesthetics, and to touch a lyricism which enthralls at the sight of his every photo. I think that most ancient part of this world that we live in you know, when it comes to culture and religion, architecture is definitely Asia. I mean, they were had incredible civiliz civilizations when Europe was still, we were living in caves and, and, and tents. And, um, so there's this real sense of the past. Uh, in color, I mean, it's more, but for me it's much more logical to photograph in color than black and white. The, the world's in color. In color photography, I think muted, soft, low contrast light works best for color photography. Even light, a cloudy day. For me and my work is the best, the best result. Um, low contrast, I, I, I think photographing people certainly in these sort of dark, moody, situations, it has much more emotion to it, uh, um, but never use flash uh, when I'm walking around, uh, I rarely use a tripod, um, I like these dark, muted situations, so I kind of gravitate towards cloudy days or times, I, I love Asia during the monsoon, for instance, when everything's this kind of even, soft, muted light. And I want it to, either the picture lives or dies on the story, on the emotional component. I don't want it to be about some filter or lens or technique. One of my pictures, which I think tells an important story, is uh, was made in Bombay of a mother and child who came up to my car window. We, I was at a stoplight. They came up. They were she was begging, and I mean, this it was raining. The there was rain on the windows. She came up to my window looking for some money, and it was just two figures. And I just instinctively raised my camera and just made two exposures and it's this very soulful picture of this mother and child peering into this air-conditioned car they're out in the heavy rain and I'm in my air-conditioned bubble and they're kind of it's just this sort of meeting of two worlds and I've always thought it was very poignant at that moment The photograph taken on September 11th, which emerged on the cover of the Times, has crystallized an instant of terror for the entire world over the years. New York will continue to be a refuge for Steve McCurry, a place to concentrate his unceasing work in pauses between his aesthetic and existential journeys in search of the lands and gazes which in his photos compose the human universe. <laughs>